deal was confirmed by the Senate in uh, December of 2008, and he served uh, for about two and a half years. And uh, the tarp was and remains a large fund that was uh, set aside by Congress to bail out the banks and other aspects of the financial sector in the aftermath of the uh, demise of Lehman Brothers. Now, prior to assuming the position of Special Inspector General, Neil was a federal prosecutor in the U.S. Attorney's Office for the Southern District of New York. He served there for more than eight years. In, in that role, uh, Neil was a senior trial counsel, and he headed the mortgage fraud group, which investigated and prosecuted all aspects of mortgage fraud, from retail mortgage fraud cases to investigations involving potential securities fraud with respect to collateralized debt obligations. Uh, Neil has also had extensive experience as a line prosecutor, leading white-collar prosecutions during his tenure as a member of the Securities and Commodities Fraud Unit, which included the case that led to the conviction of the former president of Repco, Tom Grant, and the guilty plea of Philip Bennett, Repco's former chief executive officer. He received the Attorney General's John Marshall Award for his work on the, on the Repco case. He also led the investigation that resulted in the indictment of the 50 top leaders of the Revolutionary Armed Forces of Columbia Park on narcotics charges. So before he was involved in uh, securities fraud, he was uh, working with the, uh, the government uh, to uh, arrest uh, our drug traffickers. And uh, that case is, is described by the uh, then Attorney General as the largest narcotics indictment filed in U.S. history. So, Neil is one cool dude, put it that way, in economics talk. This is an economics uh, presentation, a presentation of the economics department, but it's also a, uh, an event that's hosted by, the, uh, by our new uh, Center for Finance, Law, and Policy. And both organizations are delighted that you're joining with us today. Let's give Neil a big warm round of applause. Get ready for a great talk uh, by a New York Times bestselling author, whose new book is Bailout. Take a look. Thank you, Larry, and uh, thank you all for coming out today, and thank you to the Center for hosting this event, and, and uh, happy day after the day after uh, the election. Um, it, it's hard to believe it was just four years ago that we were we were just sitting after uh, the first election of, of President Obama, and, and what a difference four years made. Um, I remember back then, uh, as it seemed like our entire financial system was falling apart all around us. And from my seat as a, a lower Manhattan, watching these historic names and these wealthy institutions uh, disappear, get bailed out uh, just day after day. And, and after that election, as a country, we really were at a crossroads with our new president. Uh, would we go back to the, for our financial system, go back to the, the same rules and regulations that, that arose after the last giant financial crisis of the Great Depression? Rules that made banking boring, uh, but helped lead to decades and decades and decades of financial stability. You know, or would we double down on a financial system that was clearly broken? A broken status quo driven by large banks seemed to be too big to fail. Would we allow them to get even bigger? and pass a regulatory reform law that by the time it was still watered down, actually cemented the status of those banks as too big to fail and pulled the bail out again. Um, unfortunately, uh, I believe we chose the latter path, as, as I'll mention in a moment. And going back to those four years ago, um, as a federal prosecutor in Manhattan, I was watching everything that was happening, I guess, is what I was describing the sense of this past fall. My partner was, is that as a mortgage fraud prosecutor and security fraud prosecutor, I had an understanding of this financial crisis that was raging around us. Um, I had seen this how the institutions under the, the guise of financial innovation, uh, with the creation of a whole new mortgage financing system built on complex products uh, that started with mortgage-backed securities that got 
then got gathered up and turned into collateralized debt obligations that became even more complex with CDO squared, with Eagle step tile and synthetic CDO and synthetic CDO squared, with all of these steps going on and kind of default swaps, this acronym, uh, this alphabet soup. It was all based on, on U.S. mortgages. Um, and this, this financial innovation, which we were told by their cheerleaders in Wall Street and in Washington, by the regulators in New York, uh, were guaranteed fee machines and make profits, while at the same time expanding housing and actually, in the words of then New York Fed President Tim Geithner, uh, create more systemic uh, stability by reducing and spreading out risk. But I got to see that this innovation, this so-called uh, risk reducing, was, uh, was the result and created a mania of mortgages. So to create these products that people were making so much money on, there had to be a, de- there was a demand. The machine had to be fed by more and more mortgages. And under normal underwriting standards, the standards the bank uses to determine whether to give someone a loan, we were running out of mortgages pretty fast. So I saw the decimation of underwriting standards across the country. Uh, no longer did it really matter whether a borrower could actually afford to pay the loan that they were receiving. And, and fraud went from being something to be detected and rooted out and avoided to something at first to be ignored and later all but encouraged and in recent cases uh, have indicated to be concealed. Anything that got away uh, of this incredible speed, free speed generating machine. So I understood that when that bubble collapsed and that fraud rose to the surface that our finance system was built on a foundation of fraud, um, I had an understanding of the horror that we were seeing around us. I also, as a security fraud prosecutor, having uh, prosecuted one of the uh, giant financial services firms, uh, Repco, involved in a two and a half billion dollar fraud, saw how our system of, of, of financial institutions uh, were built on this foundation of opacity. Uh, people didn't really know what was going on uh, from the disclosures of what their assets were really worth, uh, which made them very prone to runs and collapse uh, when rumors suddenly came out and questioned what the value of those assets were especially when combined with their incredible reliance on short-term overnight funding, which could get spooked and disappear uh, in, in a blink of an eye. So I had an understanding and a sense of horror, but as I said, my horror was somewhat detached. Uh, detached because it didn't really impact me all that much. Uh, I was a renter. I didn't own a home, so spiraling down in real estate prices uh, wasn't impacting me. Um, and I had just about the most secure job you could have. I was a United States government employee, career civil servant in the Department of Justice. Um, if anything, financial crises are good for fraud prosecutors. Um, so it wasn't uh, so it wasn't really impacting me personally. Um, but that changed four years almost to the week uh, when my then boss, U.S. Attorney Michael Garcia, called me into his office. Um, and I remember getting the phone call and having that sort of fluttering in the stomach. I had been a supervisor for a few months and still had that call to the principal office feeling uh, when I got a call from the boss. And I remember walking up the stairs trying to think of. You know what judge I might have assembled that day, or what other district I was stealing their cases from might have called the, the, the complaint to the bar. Uh, and I sat down in his office, he was on the phone, and he hands me a printout. And listed on the top of the printout was the word Special Inspector General. And I'm sort of half reading it, not really understanding it. Mike gets off the phone and then starts explaining to me what he had given me. And apparently, when Congress passed uh, the Emergency Economic Stabilization Act, which created the Troubled Asset Relief Program, or TARP, the $700 billion bailout of Wall Street. Uh, they included in a very little notice provision uh, the creation of this brand new office called the Office of the Special Inspector General for TARP, or TIG TARP, you know, one of the worst acronyms imaginable in Washington. And Mike explained to me that this new office was going to have two functions, um, and that Congress created it uh, with the understanding and the fear that pushing so much government money out on such a quick period of time in the midst of a giant financial panic would inevitably draw a lot of criminal flies uh, to all this government money. Um, so part of this new office was going to be a law enforcement agency, uh, a full-fledged mini-FBI for the park with guns and badges, search warrants, search warrants, special agents kicking down doors, dragging people out of bed, putting them in handcuffs, uh, and taking them to jail. Uh, full law enforcement authority, law enforcement agency. The second part was an oversight function, uh, and Mike explained to me that that role was uh, fairly providing reports to Congress, doing audits of, of the process that Treasury used, uh, generally to provide transparency so the American people in Congress would understand what was going on with this expenditure of so much taxpayer money 
down, as well as to make recommendations to seek out opportunities for waste, fraud, and abuse, uh, and to help keep Treasury's eye on the ball as they're running this program for the policy goals and objectives that Congress issued when they when they passed this remarkable, remarkable bill. And as Mike is telling me about this, I'm sort of half-listed just trying to figure out why it is he's telling me about all this. Now, Mike is a U.S. attorney that's a presidentially appointed position since October 2008. Uh, he's a Republican. Uh, at this point, it was pretty clear to me that, uh, I think to just about everyone, that Obama was going to win the election and Mike was going to be out of his job. And I was thinking that maybe he was going to take this job. This was going to be, as he described it, a presidentially appointed Senate-confirmed job uh, from then-President George W. Bush. And I was thinking that maybe Mike was going to pitch me to go with him. So I started thinking as Mike was talking by planning my polite refusal. Uh, I had no interest whatsoever in going to Washington. Um, among the many reasons I later then offered, I offered Mike very shortly. Uh, I was getting married in January. Uh, we lived in New York. I love New York. I had the only job I ever wanted uh, or ever aspired to as an assistant United States attorney. I was just getting the mortgage fraud group off the ground. I had a big trial in Westville against the Southside Council coming up. Uh, and above all, I really had no interest in moving to Washington. Um, as Larry said in his introduction, I worked on the FARC case, uh, the narco-terrorist organization down in Columbia, and I had my fair share of run-ins with the Department of Justice and the Department of State in that case, and I had no interest in going back to that swamp that is Washington, D.C. Um, and when Mike told me that, yes, he's the reason why he was telling me this was he was considering me for the job, I went through these various excuses, and Mike knocked me down one after the other, and so I rolled out what I thought would be the big gun that would get me out of this. I said, look, Mike, I don't know if you know this, but I'm a registered Democrat. And because this was a George W. Bush appointment, I thought that would get me off the hook. Uh, Mike didn't know that. I think he winced a little bit. Uh, but then, no, 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 don't worry, it's a merit appointment. I then said, oh, and by the way, Mike, I donated $200 to the Obama campaign just last week. He winced a little bit, but shortly, this was no, nothing to do with politics. And I sort of rolled my eyes and thought about these unicorns and fairies that were going to come down and have hand out George W. Bush presidential appointees to high profile positions to Obama conflicting Democrats. Um, Mike told me uh, that it really wasn't my case, uh, that this was my obligation to take this job. Uh, he reminded me that our office, which sat just a few blocks from the World Trade Center, uh, of what its reaction was when I was a junior prosecutor uh, to the terrorist attacks of 9 11. And because our office had experience in doing terrorism prosecutions, we're the only one in the country, how the prosecutors in our office who had that experience stepped up and sacrificed days, weeks, months, and sometimes years of their lives working on that case to bring justice because they're the ones who had the skills and necessary experience to do so. He said, we were seeing the economic equivalent of 9-11 and that the taxpayer has spent eight plus years training me, paying a lot of money to give me the skills of security fraud and mortgage fraud, which were going to be necessary uh, for what he described as a $700 billion cluster of fraud. He uses the word cluster a lot. Um, but, so, it was a good speech. Uh, he called it his God and country speech, and it worked. And I told him I'd go in. I was home that night and talked it over with my wife, um, somewhat hopeful that she would put the kibosh on it. And I explained to her uh, that he'd have to move to D.C., he'd have to get out of practice, he'd have colleges in New York. Uh, but unfortunately, she said to me the same thing that Mike did, which is that you have to do this. So I, I gave Mike the green light. I, I really didn't think it was going to happen. Um, and it was a whirlwind. Within a week of that conversation, I'd been down to interview with the White House and the Treasury Department, two buildings I never imagined I would ever set foot in in my life, uh, and was told that I was going to be the nominee for this job. Within six weeks, I had two confirmation hearings and was confirmed by the United States Senate uh, and sat in, at 8 a.m. on Friday, December 15th, in the office of Secretary of the Treasury, Hank Paulson, um, taking the oath of office to be Special Inspector General for the Park. Now, as I was taking that oath, and many thoughts were racing through my mind. Uh, one of them was the presumption that I was there to do a law enforcement job. That was the closest to the job I was focused on. Uh, that's why they picked me, I assume. Um, and I really thought that's where the focus would be. And I thought to myself, well, gee, these Treasury guys, they must kind of know what they're doing on the banking side. And I'll give them some help here and there uh, where there's potential for fraud. And that was more of my mindset going into the job. Uh, unfortunately, I realized very, very, very quickly that I was wrong. Uh, that the oversight function of protecting taxpayers was going to be what predominantly took up most of my time for the next 27 
mind. Um, it started when I just had a very simple recommendation for what I thought was pretty basic transparency. Hey guys, we just gave hundreds of billions of dollars to the bank. Let's have them report on what they're doing with the money. What are they doing with that taxpayer money? And it wasn't just that they said, no, we're not going to do that. We're not going to issue that requirement. It was pure hostility. I was told that I was stupid, that I was playing politics. Um, I, when I said that I was going to go ahead and do the survey myself to find out the answer, I was told that if I did so, I would destroy parts and look at the entire country's banking system. I was, about nine months later, when I was still taking the position, I was first out by the then Secretary of the Treasury, the new one, and current, uh, Tim Geithner, who had been to suggest that he was anything other than the single most transparent Secretary of the Treasury in this country's history. Um, and again, I edited for the audience uh, the exact words. So, and I began to realize that the words I was hearing, the explanations, the sentences, were the same ones that were being offered by the CEOs of the largest financial institutions who were the recipients of so much of our funds. But it wasn't just transparency. Um, I started seeing the fact that this money was going out with very few strings attached, um, very few conditions, and really opportunities for fraud, conflicts of interest baked into the program, real problems. And I started pointing them out to the treasury officials I was dealing with. Um, the, reaction, the reaction back wasn't that they know you're wrong. It was that they may be like, look, you know, you don't need to worry about it. These are banks. And these banks would never risk their reputation by putting profit over the public purpose of these programs. That was my reaction. I, it was, I, it, I, was, I was saying to them, where have you guys been for the last couple of years? This very Bluefanian notion that reputational risk is all we need to govern the market, uh, and we don't have to worry about the fraud because the market will correct themselves, have been so thoroughly disproven. And the guys have frankly had proven that they would put profit over just about anything, particularly their own reputation. I was told by Bill Bailey, who's now the, the president of the New York Fed, uh, at the time he was acting president, uh, while Geithner was going through the nomination process, um, there was a new program that was going to be a $200 billion taxpayer program that was going to try to bring back the market for consumer loans by turning them into bonds, turning them into asset backed securities, similar to the giant mess that we had that caused the financial crisis. And I was looking at this program and saw all these vulnerabilities to fraud, and I asked him, well, what is the how are we going to protect against fraud? What are the taxpayer protections? And he told me that, you know, we're going to rely on two things. One, investor due diligence. That works really well. And second, credit rating agencies. We're going to require every one of these bonds that the taxpayer has probably 95% standing behind to triple A rating from the credit rating agency. And I said to myself, and to answer Phil, um, you know, how can we do it? How can we bet $200 billion of taxpayer money on credit rating agencies which had so distinguished themselves uh, for the incredible inaccuracy of their ratings in the run-up to the financial crisis? Rating agencies that demonstrated that they would sell their soul for a few basis points of profit and gave away those AAA ratings to the highest bidder um, on a regular basis. Uh, how could you possibly trust all of this on the rating agencies? And his response, I'll never forget, was, well, we're very confident that they won't embarrass themselves again. So I said that I asked myself, where have these guys been? And I realized where they had been. Goldman Sachs, Bear Stern, Merrill Lynch, Bank of America, Goldman Sachs, Goldman Sachs, Goldman Sachs. Everywhere I looked was Goldman Sachs. And, and what I realized is that when they came to Washington, and Look, these were patriotic people who were serving their country. But when they came to Washington, they didn't leave that ideology of Wall Street, of the big Wall Street banks behind. They brought it with them. And as they were running these programs, they were kind of that same most fruitful Wall Street which was for America attitude. An attitude that, as I saw as these programs unfolded, led to them choosing the interests of the largest financial institutions um, that had essentially driven our country into crisis and were the recipients on such generous terms of taxpayer balance. Uh, those interests were put first, and all the other interests and, and, and um, goals of the policy goals of the car program uh, were kicked to the side. 
So I really felt very quickly um, that I was going to ask that that's my, with my role as tax care advocate was going to be more than that of, 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 of necessary being uh, looking out from a, a law enforcement agency perspective. And I really want to make this clear. This is not a Republican Democrat thing. Uh, those words, the reputational risk, I heard, certainly heard from day one from the Bush Paulson people, but it didn't change with President Obama and Secretary of Treasury Tim Geithner. And, and look, you know, I remember my nephew and I, and I'm kind of a little Democrat, he's somewhere off from the left, but he's so far off the left, he might have fallen off. Um, so we circled our, our calendar, January 20th, 2009, uh, because we were so looking forward to the inauguration. and. and that, that all the people were going to be coming in, and surely everything would change. Um, and other than the changing of the calendar and the names and faces of the people we were dealing with, uh, almost nothing changed. Um, those same arguments, that same attitude, that same deficit um, continued. So I think that we ended up shifting the focus of what our time and our efforts were. Um, and I think over, over the next 27 months, uh, we had what I would say a mixed bag of success and failure um, as an agency. Uh, I think we had, where we had our greatest successes was limiting the damage from fraud. On the law enforcement side, uh, more than 100 people so far have been charged uh, criminally with fraud related to the Department of Park Program. Uh, we locked up one CEO down in Florida uh, who was conspiring with another officials at another bank to try to steal, and they actually got approval for more than $550 million of Park money, which would have gone right into a massive multi billion dollar fraud. We're able to stop that money in its track, and he's now serving a 30 year prison sentence. Uh, so we had some success on that side. Uh, and then we had some successes on the, uh, on, the, on the oversight side in, in limiting the damage from fraud. Uh, we got a lot of good protections in that program that said that we wanted to rely uh, only on the credit rating agencies after we went to Congress uh, and they started putting some pressure on the Fed. Uh, we were able to stop a trillion dollar program that, that, that Geithner had announced. The public private investment program, again, not through these parts, persuasive arguments to Treasury, uh, but going to Congress and getting a bill passed that limited their authority, and ultimately convincing the Fed not to sign on on what would have been a, a, a just a prolific giveaway that I believe would have cost tens, at least tens of billions and maybe hundreds of billions of dollars of losses to fraud. So I think in those areas we had some success, uh, but we also had our failures. And I think our, our most concentrated failures uh, was our inability. Uh, to keep Treasury's eye on the ball, as I said before, uh, to fulfill the policy goals of PARC. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the failure perhaps is, 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 is best demonstrated by the Home Affordable Modification Program um, or the HAMP program, um, the, the desire for PARC to help struggling homeowners. Now, just to take a step back, um, those of you who remember, uh, PARC wasn't a sure thing when it was first announced. Uh, it got voted down the first time in the House of Representatives, and one of the problems for George Bush and Hank Paulson was that the Republicans were not supporting PARC, particularly in the House. So to get this bill passed, they needed to get Democrats, and they needed all the Democrats, including progressives, uh, in the House of Representatives. Now, as you can imagine, this is not a group that would normally be uh, so on board to give $700 billion of taxpayer money uh, to the same Wall Street institutions uh, that had created the crisis, created so many problems in their neighborhoods, uh, and to bail them out of their problems. So what they were much more concerned about was the foreclosure crisis. Uh, and this was very real in, in places, uh, you know, in urban areas, the city of Baltimore, uh, and other places. Uh, this is what they were concerned about. So they made a deal with Treasury. And the way the deal worked was, okay, Treasury, um, what are you going to do with this money? And at that point, Paulson said, well, what we're going to do is we're going to buy $700 billion worth of mortgages. Mortgages and all the different bonds that were created out of mortgages. But Treasury was going to be the owner of this massive revolving fund of mortgages. So they said, okay, this is, the, this is the deal. We'll give you the authorization to buy them. But once you buy them, you need to modify them. You need to modify the terms to make them more affordable where it makes sense so people can stay in their homes. So these classic mortgages that were created to fill that securitization machine, mortgages that borrowers often had no idea what they were signing on to, once they could never afford, you're going to need to modify that as the owner of these mortgages. And so he said, okay, sure, we'll do it. And there's whole provisions within the law that requires Treasury to implement that type of program. That was part of the deal. The problem is that before the ink was even dropped on George Bush's signature on the TARP bill, 
Treasury changed the plan. So we know when buying troubled assets and mortgages, inside came pumping hundreds of billions of dollars of equity into the bank. We bought stock in the bank, creating equity. In other words, we helped fill in the giant capital holes that had been blown in these companies, threatening them with insolvency because of their badness on the mortgage market. But we didn't buy those mortgages. So that promise kind of disappeared for a while. But after the election and with um, President Obama coming in, um, when Congress had structured it, they actually held back the second half of our funds. And President Bush and President elect Obama came to Congress and said, hey, by the way, guys, we need that other 350. Uh, this time, we need to do those progressive math that said, ah, once bitten, twice shy. We want a written commitment from you that you will use at least $50 billion of our funds to help struggling homeowners. Um, and in a letter from Larry Summers, the leader of Congress, that promise was made. And a lot of promises were made in that letter to get that second half of our funds, including accounting for use of part of money, Existing decisions, none of which were fulfilled. But um, what that was made and was announced was a $50 billion program that the President announced the Treasury decided, said was going to help up to 4 million families stay in the home. 4 million. Significant program using $75 billion of money, 50 from parks and 25 from another school. So this was going to be how this promise was going to ultimately to be fulfilled. And as I said, this was one of our biggest failures, and I think one of Trump's biggest failures. We never came close. There was about 830,000 ongoing modifications out of this program out of a promise of $4 million. Um, that $50 billion, a little bit more than four has been spent. And just to give you some scope and context for that, uh, American Express, credit card company, got $3.9 billion of part money uh, back in 2008. The country, the homeowners, Without which, there never would have been a bank bailout. Congress never passed its part. That's the amount of money they got in fulfillment of that promise, that necessary promise to get that bill passed to preserve home ownership. So why did it happen? Why was it such a failure? Um, there's a number of reasons. The, the, the design of the program was disastrous. It was ready, fire, aim at its worst. I remember getting a briefing on this program um, in, in, in early February of 2008, uh, 2009. And basically, no way Treasury had any idea of what the program was going to be, and it hadn't been announced yet in detail. And so, what are you going to know? Like, oh, it's going to be a few weeks, if not months, before we announce it. Like, okay, well, let me know when it's ready, because this thing is not ready. I mean, you couldn't answer basic questions. That night, I heard on the radio President Obama announced that he was going to announce the program in a matter of days. Uh, they weren't ready, they never caught up. What they did was they essentially outsourced the program to the largest banks themselves, their mortgage servicing arm. And they were completely unequipped to handle hundreds of thousands, let alone millions of, 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 of mortgage modifications. That system buckled and then broke. Worse still, the design was flawed. The incentives were not sufficient. In fact, the, the program had such severe conflicts of interest um, that it often made more sense for the bank and the mortgage servicing arm to string out a borrower and eventually put them into foreclosure and put them into the Treasury-funded mortgage modification, permanent modification. Um, and the way they did this is it's kind of interesting. Um, when a borrower wanted to get into the program, they'd go through a trial period. Uh, and the idea is to make sure that they actually make the payments for a few months, they'll make payments, and they'll get put into uh, the permanent status and be part of this program. Um, but what Treasury allowed the banks to do was to string that process out for 8, 9, 10, 12, 14, 15 months. They also allowed them to include something called late fees. And a late fee, you know, late fee is because we all had to pay late fees. But a late fee is if you're late paying your mortgage, the, the bank could charge you a fee, um, a late fee, a percentage of your missed payment. But what Treasury told the bank said, in this program, you can accrue late fees for every month, even though the people actually make the trial modification payment. Because they were making the full payment, they were making a trial payment. So you, the bank, you can accrue payments month after month after month. But if you put them into a program at the end of that period of time, you have to waive all those fees. But if you foreclose, because it doesn't work out for one reason or the other, you get to keep all those fees and take them off the top during the foreclosure sale. So they created a program based on the incentives that would make it more profitable to take a struggling borrower, 
squeeze out the last of their life savings and then throw them on the foreclosure scrap heap with more money than fulfilling the policy goals of the program. And they were willing to risk their reputation uh, to go after that profit motive. That's why we saw more failures in the CAR program uh, in this program than we did successes. Um, and this incentivized all sorts of bad behavior, all sorts of reasons to pull the rug out. Um, there, are, there are legends, how many there are, but one of the most popular was say, oh, I'm sorry, Barbara, we lost your documents. And we saw mortgage services who said they lost the documents one, two, five, ten, fifteen times. So some of those in the survey, the average was six times the borrower had to submit the exact same documents. Because sure, the services would say, oh yeah, we got the documents, here's your foreclosure. Or we could say, you know what, we never got that piece of paper. I'm sorry, here's the marshal knocking on your door to throw you out of your home, even though you've made every payment and given us every document. Terrible abuses. Um, and this was remarkably frustrating, as you can imagine. And um, in 2009, we had an oversight meeting uh, with, with Secretary Geithner. Um, and I was there, and um, now Senator-elect Elizabeth Warren was there. She was the, the chief of the Congressional Oversight Panel. And she was really grilling Geithner on this. I think the program was going to be this goal. What are you going to do about all these abuses of homeowners? Uh, because despite her push and my recommendation, Treasury wouldn't enforce the terms of its contract and impose financial penalties on them. Uh, what are you going to do about this? And in a way that really only Elizabeth could get under Geithner's skin, um, he became more and more impatient uh, and finally kind of snapped at her and said, Look, by our calculation, the bank can handle somewhere in the neighborhood of about 10 million foreclosures spread out over a period of time, but anything more than that, or if it was to be compensated, uh, would render them potentially insolvent, which meant another round of bank bailouts. What this program will do, he said, is it will, quote-unquote, foam the runway for the bank. And by that he meant it would extend out the foreclosure crisis for the benefit of the bank. And when another treasury official told me, explained to me that part of the idea was to let the bank earn their way out of this. And all the other bailout-friendly programs that Treasury and the Fed and the FDIC had put uh, in for the benefit of the bank would help fill those capital holes. And that foam, of course, was the rest homeowners uh, we were strung out and thrown into foreclosure, but we realized that that day that's not who this program was about. Like so many other aspects of CARP, it was about protecting the bank, forming the runway for the bank. This was not a program that was going to help 4 million people stay in their homes. This was another form of backdoor bailout to assist the financial institution. So that, that program was a failure, and, and you know, the failure was, went beyond just that program itself. Um, when they were explaining to us, we finally got the contours of this program, uh, it raised a red flag for me. As a mortgage fraud prosecutor, one of the things that we saw once the recession kicked in were these sales of mortgage fraudsters who would go out to struggling borrowers um, and essentially sell fake services to help them with foreclosure relief. And the way this came was to say, hey, give me $5,000 up front and I will make your foreclosure problems go away. And it's a pernicious scam. They, 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 you know, they pocket the money, they do nothing. They tell the borrower not to worry about it again until there's the marshal knocks on the door to throw them out of their house. They thought they were actually getting foreclosure relief. So I told Treasury, look, these guys are going to come in droves to this program. They're going to sell Obama modifications for five, ten thousand dollars $10,000. This is a massive opportunity for fraud. We need to get out front. Now, I can do my end. I'll talk to DOJ. I'll talk to the FBI. I'll talk to the U.S. Attorney's offices and have them sensitize to this upcoming wave of crime. But what I can't do is go out and educate the public. We need to do targeted TV and, and radio announcements. And I gave them a list of cities that you have to do where the foreclosure fraud cells were. Things like Atlanta and Miami and L.A. You know, areas where we've seen so much fraud and knew that it was going to come. And just like before, it almost a symbolic pat on my head. I said, well, well, we're aware of it. We'll look into it. We'll think about it. But we're not really worried about it. Um, and they didn't do a single advertiser for a year and a half. And by what that point, this wave of fraud has already swept across the country. Um, and it is an epidemic of fraud uh, that, 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 that was really preventable with upfront education uh, that Treasury didn't do. So when you take all the failed modifications and the unnecessary victims of crime, uh, it really is not too much to say that this program, the one part of the law that was supposed to help Main Street and struggling homeowners, the reason why they get the votes to pass this bill, 
actually probably hurt more homeowners than they help. And it's because of this failure, uh, among others, that I believe this part of this program was a failure. Now, when I said this, I get yelled at. Um, this summer, I got yelled at by the entire crew of CNBC Swap Talk Morning Program. I've been yelled at figuratively often in the columns of the New York Times. I've certainly been yelled at by Treasury officials and others for daring to suggest that Park was a failure. I'm told, and we are told, Park was a great success. We saved the financial system from a total meltdown. That's a success. That's what Park was supposed to do. That's what it delivered. Here's a problem with this. First of all, it's not what Park was supposed to do. We'll talk about that in a moment. And second of all, what is it that we saved? We saved a thoroughly broken status quo, a broken financial system that served a certain number of elite financial banks and no one else. And how did we do it? We took banks that were deemed to be too big to fail, thus requiring their bailout, any one of which whose failure was deemed to bring down the entire financial system, and we made them bigger. They're now 20 to 25 percent bigger today. And with this presumption of bailout, comes a perversion of the normal functioning of a capitalist market. The normal capitalism institutions can fail. And that possibility of failure brings about what we, what we call market discipline. And what market discipline means is, just to use an example on Citigroup, um, an institution that, say, has a lot of risk piled up in it, has a great degree of opacity of its financial statements, so that investors and counterparties and creditors don't really know what's going on inside of it. Uh, and whether they're, they're valuing their assets correctly. Uh, and you match that up with a tremendous amount of leverage and raise their thing capital, which means they borrow a lot of money, which means that they have losses of 3 to 4 or 5%. The company would be wiped out and deemed insolvent in bankruptcy. In a normal functioning market, the creditors, the people who lend money to that institution, and the counterparty who would do business with it, wouldn't touch that company with a 10 foot pole. Or if they did, they would exact a premium. Higher interest rates, more favorable terms, which we're doing a deal or transaction. That's a normal functioning capitalist market. And that market is discipline that conforms the behavior of that institution to take less risk, have more capital, be more transparent. But if it's too big to fail, that doesn't happen. In fact, what happens is it gets flipped on its head, and that bank is able to extract a premium from its creditors and counterparties. They're able to borrow money significantly less than a smaller institution. Why? The same reason why when you go to a bank and deposit your funds, you don't ask for a copy of the 10K of the financial institution, you don't do a, a, a survey of its risk and its exposure, because you see the FBI can stick and know that your deposit is insured. Counterparties and creditors think it's too big to sell banks the same way. They assume that the government will bail them out if they get in trouble. They assume that they will be paid 100 cents on the dollar, just like AIP's counterparties were, just like Citi's depositors were, just like the Bank of America, and all the other too big to fail institutions during the financial crisis. So when Tim Gunther and Hank Paulson told the world, we will stand behind our largest financial institution, and we've got this giant pile of money to do so, yes, it helped calm markets and bring a level of stability. But it also solidified and made explicit the long implicit expectation of too big to fail. Now, this perversion thing is not new, it's not terribly controversial, the fact that this exists. Um, and that's why we were promised in the aftermath of the financial crisis uh, the type of regulatory reform that would prevent it from ever happening again. Um, and what we demanded, what we needed, what we deserved was meaningful financial regulatory reform. Instead, we got Dodd Frank. I don't have to say this in Dodd Frank's backyard. Um, and look, the bill did some good things and some positive things. But it absolutely failed in its mandate to end the era of too big to fail. It didn't happen. As I said, big banks, now even bigger. Don't need to take my word for it. Ask the rating agencies. Rating agencies get higher credit ratings for the debt of the too big to fail bank on the explicit assumption that the government will bail them out once again. Academic research indicates that banks enjoy this subsidy that you and I all pay for, whether we know it or not and that they pay absolutely nothing for is worth tens of billions of dollars a year. And these are incentives that go to creating more risk. An executive at one of these institutions, not only do they not have to worry about market discipline, which gives them the opportunity to ramp up the risk, um, they know that if they make giant bets 
that are funded and insured by the taxpayer, and they pay off great with money coming. Big profits and big bonuses, big people, lots of political and economic power. And if it doesn't work out, oh well, taxpayers always there to pick up the pieces once again. Um, so I'm not celebrating uh, this supposed success of preserving what is a thoroughly broken financial system. Um, and there's, you know, there's echoing effects of this as well. You know, one question a lot of people always ask me, where are the prosecutors? How can we have this giant financial crisis where we saw thousands of people going to jail during the S&L crisis, the last big banking crisis? Why is not the single senior executive at a senior big bank has gone to jail? Where are the criminal prosecutions? And I could spend that for just talking about the various reasons for that. But I'll just do one simple one that's tied to the to fail. Do you really think in 2008, having spent trillions and trillions of dollars and all that effort to save the largest financial institutions because we believe that the failure of any single one of them would bring down the entire economic system, that the Department of Justice is going to go out three months later and indict Goldman Sachs or Jamie Dimon and J.P. Morgan Chase? Undo all of that work with one civil indictment to bring down the company and the entire economy with it? They were too big to fail in 2008, and they became too big to fail in 2009. So, again, I'm not going to, I don't think we should celebrate too much this idea that we save the financial system, particularly, particularly because I believe with all those incentives in place, we are steadily on the march to another bigger, more significant financial crisis created in part due to the reactions that we took in part to make the banks more powerful, more concentrated, uh, and more have more political economic might than they did before. Um, but as I said before, one of the reasons why this part is a failure um, is that that really wasn't just the goal of TARP, was to, bring, was to keep the broken financial system going forward. And you think about it from Congress's perspective, um, you know, stippling hundreds of billions of dollars into a bunch of banks to cover up their, their losses um, is not exactly complicated or that difficult to do. Um, and that's why Congress demanded and Treasury promised more. One of those promises we've already talked about, preserving home ownership, uh, doing something like the foreclosure crisis, and as we know, that was a failure. Um, and as Joseph Stiglitz said uh, during congressional testimony, um, that, and I think he got this right, the whole point of passing TARP, the end was not saving the financial system. That was supposed to be a means to the greater end, the greater goal of bringing back a broader economic recovery. That was the point of TARP. That's why it got the vote to pass through Congress. And Treasury, to fulfill that promise, promised us that when they were putting the hundreds of billions of dollars into the bank, that the result would be um, to bring back the economy to restoring lending, we were told. The banks would use this money and lever it up, send the one to another government program, a potentially free loan, um, and we'll use it to lend back into this country. Get the economy, get credit had completely frozen, and this is going to be the lifeblood of the economy. That's what we were told. But what did they actually do when they gave the money out? No conditions, no strings attached. Uh, no conditions to lend the money, no incentive that they go and lend the money, and as we talked about before, no transparency to bring some level of accountability. So perhaps it's not a surprise that goal too failed, and rather than getting an expansion of lending, we saw contraction of lending quarter after quarter after quarter after quarter after they received that part money, even after they left and exited the part program uh, with Treasury Commission and the like. So, you know, so essentially, um, that's why I think TARP has failed, and as I said, uh, why I think, unfortunately, we may be on the path uh, towards another financial crisis. So having delivered such a happy, cheerful news, um, I do have some obligations to say, well, what should we do about it? Um, and I think there's a, a, a couple of areas that we think that we can and must do to get things back on the right track. Um, first of all, uh, I think we need to do something real about our too big to fail problem. I think we need to break up the largest financial institutions. And there's a lot of suggestions out there bringing back a modified form of Glass Steagall, the Depression era law that separated commercial banks, uh, commercial banking that with regard taxpayers do stand behind, and the riskier activities, including investment banking, and, and um, that's one solution. Uh, size cap, uh, putting caps on the overall size of the bank. Uh, this was something that had bipartisan support during the Dodd-Frank debate. Uh, are almost hard to say that, to imagine that. Had Republicans and Democrats supporting uh, the Brown-Kaufman amendment to Dodd-Frank. Uh, it is a bill that had legs, 
and the words of a treasury official uh, bragging shortly after his defeat, it would have passed Congress if we, being treasurer in the White House, had been behind it, but we weren't, so it didn't. Um, so that was an opportunity that got that got so but the size cap that's another solution and radically increase um, our capital levels uh, so that they rely less on borrowed money, which means that when losses come, uh, the shareholders bear them, not us the taxpayer, um, and it also helps cancel out some of that advantage they have of being able to borrow more cheaply. Um, so I think on one end we have to deal with that corrupting influence that comes with having banks that are too big to fail. Um, on the other side we also need to deal with the regulator side. Um, and this is a this crisis is a failure of regulation, and regulators were looking the other way. Um, and I believe we bailed out also a crisis of regulation of thoroughly captured uh, regulators who were not looking out for the best interest of the taxpayer. And I, I have an anecdote from, from the book, uh, I think that sort of depicts a certain example of what, what regulators are confronted with in Washington. Um, in 2010, uh, I had a really, really bad relationship uh, with the guy who was running the park. Uh, his name was Kurt Allison. Uh, he had a long story career on Wall Street. He was the president of Merrill Lynch. He went on to become the CEO of CIA Press and retired uh, to a very comfortable retirement uh, before getting called back to retirement by, by Hank Paulson to run Fannie Mae uh, after the government took it over. And in 2009, he was named President Obama's choice to run Tarp, to be the assistant secretary. Um, and we didn't get along uh, at all. Uh, our weekly meetings had devolved into shouting matches. Uh, and one time I got yelled at because I was doing a presentation and I got permission from Fannie Lodge to use some clips of one of the actors playing Geithner talking about the stress test, uh, which I thought was hilarious. Uh, and I think I said it in class, you know, it was pretty funny. Um, so I was really angry about that, told me that he was angry, and I kept hearing to find out he was really angry and how disrespectful it was. And, uh, so I learned that not only did, did Geithner talk like a sailor, uh, but also has no sense of humor. Uh, so things have been, so we decided we're going to clear the air and have a drink. So we go to one of these terrible Washington restaurants, uh, we're having a glass of wine, and you know, chit chat, I talk about how my daughter is about to be born, and um, he's talking about his kids. Uh, and in sort of the conversation, the clouds gather. Um, and he said, you know, you know, you're a smart guy, a young guy, you know, obviously talented guy, press seems to like you, Congress seems to like you. you got a real future in front of you. I don't really think so. Um, you thought about what you want to do next. Because this is just a temporary job. And it wasn't a temporary job, you know, by definition, once Tarp is over, if Tarp is over. Um, and you know, you're thinking maybe a job on Wall Street, something like that. You know, I really can't think about that. I got to focus on the job. I can't have those thoughts. He said, "Well, I got to let you know, you're really doing yourself real harm here." Like, what do you mean? Like, like your tone, the harshness of your tone of your criticism. Like, you're really doing yourself a lot of harm for your future, for you and your family. I said, "Well, I said, I can't really do that. And I don't really know Wall Street. I'm terribly interested in that again." He said, "Well, what about maybe something in government? You know, you've been in government a while. An appointment." You know, maybe a, a judgeship from Obama, an appointment, a federal judgeship. I mean, you know, I, that would be great. Well, it could be better. I'd love to be a federal, federal judge. What would I want to be one? Um, but I don't think the Obama administration is going to be on tour. You know, I'm a Democrat, but you know, some of my criticisms have been pretty harsh. I don't think they're too happy with me. I said, well, it doesn't have to be that way anymore. All you have to do is improve your tone, be a little bit more positive, a little bit more upbeat, and these things can happen for you. And I have to tell you, I was. I felt wrong. I was angry. I thought I had been threatened and bribed um, and was, was somewhat outraged. And I got on the phone and I called my deputy, Kevin, and uh, I related the whole story to him word for word. And Kevin had also been a narcotics prosecutor, as I had an international narcotics prosecutor. Um, and he said to me, uh, you just got the gold of the way. And I laughed. But I had a bullet or the bribe. And what Kevin was referring to is that um, Pablo Escobar, the Colombian drug trafficking kingpin, the way he worked in Colombia, uh, how he corrupted society, he'd go to a judge or a magistrate or a politician and give them two choices. He'd say, you can either take this giant bag of papers uh, and do my bidding and look the other way, or you could take this bullet in your brain, the bullet or the bribe, the bullet or the lead. And Kevin told me that I just received a white-collar Washington equivalent. At the time, I, I thought Kevin was right. But I realized, as, as the years have gone by, that that's not what happened. Herb was not threatening me, and he certainly wasn't bribing me, he wasn't really offering me a judgeship. 
Uh, what he was doing was explaining to me, as a veteran of both Wall Street and Washington, how the world works. And the problem is, is that while it was made explicit to me, it is implicit to every regulator who faces off with Wall Street. Go along and get along, have a good positive term, don't be too aggressive, and great things can happen to you, including when you get your chance to spin through the revolving door, a giant pot of gold at the end of that Wall Street rainbow. Or be aggressive, have the bad tone, and you do yourself real harm. So I think in order to get to the place we need to be as a country, not only do we have to deal with the banks, we also have to deal with, with our regulators and change those incentives and change the economic and promotional incentive for regulators of doing good regulatory work as opposed to worrying about what's next and the harm that you might be doing yourself. Now, so the next question, I guess, the final question is, is there any hope? Uh, we just had an election. President Obama was re-elected. Is there that hope? What the Wall Street really hated Obama? Is there a hope? And I think we look a little bit domestic. We uh, have no hope. Um, again, this is the administration that fought tooth and nail against Brown Kaufman Amendment to break up the bank. They are not about to say, look at all that, having campaigned and won on the fiction that Dodd Frank had ended too big to fail. They're not about to turn around now. And look, they didn't do so, you know, out of fun. They did it because that's their ideology. They have that ideology that large, giant financial institutions are a good thing, not a bad thing. Um, and all of these officials, these captured officials I'm talking about, as I said, just as bad under the Obama administration as, as the Bush administration. Um, but what do I see areas of hope? Well, I think one area is the whole concept of breaking up the bank. It's changed a lot since I stepped down in March as to, uh, as to who, who, who is on board. It was kind of a lonely place to be back then. Uh, uh, as an academic, uh, some former special inspector general, uh, and frankly, not that, not many, that all that many others. But since then, a lot of people have seen the light in the aftermath of Dot Frank and seeing its failures that we need to do something more. Um, so, for a modified form of Glass Siegel, you have the vice chairman of the FDIC, who actually has been on the team long before I was. But, but he's now the vice chair of the FDIC, Kyle Hunnick, who, 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 is, who advocates for this type of reform. Uh, a, a governor of the, of the New York, of the uh, Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve recently came out uh, in, in favor of a degree of price of, of, of price tax. Um, Sandy Wise is Dr. Frankenstein, CEO of Citigroup, a man who truly created these Frankenstein monsters, the mega banks that went around destroying the world in 2008, came out on TV and said that he too recognizes that we need to break up the larger banks. Um, and it joins a growing chorus of members of Congress, uh, of, of academics, of, of regulators, presidents of, of, of different Federal Reserve banks. So I do think there is a growing momentum um, for that. Second, on the regulatory side, um, if you look at the Consumer Protection Bureau, um, they're doing some good things there. And one of the things that impressed me is that they recognized the concept of regulatory capture from the very beginning uh, and implemented policies to try to avoid that. And when I see the Chamber of Commerce complain that, gee, the Consumer Protection Bureau is out of control, it actually has an adversary relationship with the banks that it's supposed to be regulating, it makes me smile a little bit. I mean, only in this country can we think that it's bad that a regulator should have adversarial interests to the, the institution in which it's regulating. That's kind of the whole point. So that gives me some hope. Um, and finally, uh, I do see some, 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 some wonderful green shoots in this most recent election. Uh, when Senator Brown, the, the sponsor of Brown Coffin to break up the bank, uh, when Wall Street scores every single dollar seemingly imaginable uh, to try to beat him, and he beats that back and wins, that gives me some hope. Uh, and, and I'm here, and this is not pandering, uh, but when Elizabeth Warren uh, stands up to those interests in, in Wall Street, and what they try to do, and everything they unloaded uh, to try to keep her from getting into the United States, States Senate. When I can say Senator elect Elizabeth Warren, who I know will be a forceful, forceful fighter, as someone who the United States Senate has never quite seen anyone quite like her, uh, as I wrote earlier today, um, that gives me a, a, a lot of hope. So, on that hopeful note, uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions you have.
take, you have maybe a lot of one mega bag and you put it into a lot of, and it's really opaque and it's highly leveraged, and you put it into a lot of small bags that are opaque and highly leveraged, and you just have a lot more individual problems that, you know, all the time is constantly in one place. I think the problems are opacity and, and leverage. I, mean, I don't think that, uh, that uh, uh, for example, banks per se is going to really help. We saw in the SML crisis that we had a lot of smaller entities engaged in, uh, in problematic behavior, and uh, there's a big financial mess there, too. So, uh, how do you find it? Well, I don't disagree. Um, which is why I think, you know, I, I, I sort of lay free of the option that um, I think all three should be there. So I think that you, know, you can combine side caps with, uh, but also separating the riskier from the insured part, uh, but also increase capital. I mean, I think increase leverage and the leverage ratios we have in this country and the reliance on risk-weighted, uh, risk-weighted assets are these sort of very complicated formulas um, that make it look like banks have capital when they really don't. Uh, is, is some of these, these, these concepts that I think help lead to the massive exposure to uh, real estate in this country and to sovereign debt in Europe. Um, you know, all of those things have to be in place. Um, so let me deal with my problem first, and then we can get to my problem. I mean, I think right now what's threatening the entire economy, what's threatening the other financial crisis, is all these perversions in the market that come with the presumption of bailouts. And so that, to me, is the priority, is to, is to focus on getting rid of that. Uh, but certainly, you look what's going on in Germany, where you have the, uh, the Landes banks and, and you know, the, the power that they've accumulated, which is on par with the, the political power that our large banks have. Um, I think in, significantly increased capital requirements help with a lot of those issues. Um, but that ultimately, you know, these are all real problems that we have in our banking system. Uh, and we've got to start somewhere. And I think the too big to fail problem is the one that keeps me up at night the most uh, and seems to be the hardest one to deal with from a regulatory perspective as well, because of that incredible political power. And just, you know, right back, I mean, I don't know how many of you watched this summer when Jamie Dimon, the CEO of, of J.P. Morgan Chase, uh, went to testify in front of the United States Senate. Um, but it was a remarkable flexing of political muscle in front of the United States like Senate Banking Committee. And the obsequiousness of the members of the Senate uh, who were supposed to be calling Dimon on the carpet for a massive $7 billion loss on a, a, a tough set gone, gone wild. Um, and it turned around to him, then asking him, how should we regulate these better? Uh, and talking about how smart and genius he is. Like, to me, that type of political power you don't see from a smaller bank. Um, and by the way, one of the things that gives me hope is that next time he goes into that committee and runs into a, a buzzsaw of Elizabeth Warren, it's going to be a much, much different result on guessing. For being there. With the top program, it seems like Geithner and the Fed, and, you know, maybe you were the later to the party, but it seemed as if it was just designed on behalf of bailing out the banks and not for mortgage reduction or that type of relief or to, or to, or to um, work out those types of loans. And, and so maybe as it was designed, it actually did exactly what it was supposed to do. It just wasn't the story that was told to the public. So help, help me understand that. Well, you know, in, in the private market, you know, if I were to go to you and say, hey, can you give me $700 billion? I'm going to do these things with it. But I never actually intend to do those things with it. I intend to do something else entirely for an entirely purpose. Well, you get locked up. Um, you get in this fraud. So when I hear this argument of, of well, that's not what they really meant to do anyhow. Um, well, that's deceiving members of Congress. That's deceiving the American public. Uh, because they knew if they went to Congress and said, hey, I want $700 billion, and the sole goal for this program is going to be to save the bank. Um, and that was the justification for the bill. And that's what was in the bill. And that's what they did. Um, and we're going to preserve the status quo, and that's our goal. Um, hooray for that. Uh, that's transparent. That's good government. And maybe, maybe I would disagree with it as a policy perspective. But they would have done a promise to fulfill that promise. 
But to bait and switch and, and say, look, we know the only way we're going to get the money is if we make these series of promises and then do nothing to fulfill those promises. I mean, yes, there can be a level of cynicism that says, well, you know, they did what they needed to do. Um, but that's not how democracy works. That's not how, you know, it's supposed to work. Um, and the free was on that end. As I said, the New York Times, uh, certain aspects of it, and CNBC and Treasury can all congratulate them on this massive success. And uh, as an oversight entity and as a taxpayer, uh, I'm offended by it. And I, I think it's a failure. But, you know, I remember um, I was fighting with one New York Times columnist. And he said, well, why should you care? Why should I care? I said, you know what? You don't need to care. You don't need to care at all. But some of you do. It was my job to care then, and I still care now. Um, and that's why some talk to people about it, try to get them to care as well. Thank you. Uh, what do you think about TDM? Was that part of the bailout, too? And, you know, uh, everybody seems to think, at least in Detroit, that it helps. A lot of people keep their jobs uh, and give the uh, momentum to try and straighten out its European operations, etc. So, this morning I was sworn in. Um, Hank Paulson looks at me um, and says, this sort of raspy voice. Um, so, it looks like Jim and Heather are pushing by the end of the year, unless we can start money. Uh, so, we're going to do it. What do you think? And this is the thing I thought I was like, why are you asking me? <laughs> the thing I think about Detroit is that I, you know, I drove a, a 95 Chevy Camaro convertible down to New York a few days ago, and uh, and my dad he came and he's an actual, uh, his father was a, a lifetime electrician for, for GM, and that was our, our auto industry experience, which probably gave us more auto industry experience than the actual people at Treasury and the White House who ran the auto bailout. But that's, that's another discussion. Um, so, what I, after my dad really said to me, you know, we walked down, I'm like, oh, it's not meeting, 25 minutes, I can pay the surgery, look at us. He's like, yeah, that's something. You know, you just gave, uh, your first official act was to bless a tens of billions of dollars of car money to a purpose that I guarantee you many members of Congress will not agree with what they voted for uh, when they passed the car. Um, so I went down and we looked at the statute, and the language in the bill is so broad uh, that it, it clearly fits, I believe it clearly fits within um, the definition of what is a public asset and what is a financial institution. Uh, although it seems crazy to say that a loan to a auto company could be a purchase of a public asset from a financial institution, the way Congress has written the bill is so broad. Um, I, I think that whether it was a good idea or a bad idea, um, I, you know, I, the fear was so tremendous when I got there in Washington. Um, uh, what surprised me is that they went over to the edge and they looked at the abyss and they couldn't see the bottom. Just sort of how I remember one of them, you know, talking, or one of them uh, describing it to me. And I think that, you know, in the midst of that fear, the idea of the auto companies going belly up at that moment in December of 2008 um, and the implications that would have had on the economy, um, it's very hard for me to second guess. And so look, my whole job was second guessing. My job description was Monday morning quarterback. Um, and I approached that, that role, which was a deal. Um, but I, I, it's hard for me to say that that was not the right thing to do, given where we were in, 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 in the economy. Now, I think with that said, I think the processes and decision-making that went into that uh, was at times severely flawed. Uh, one of the things we did a report about, I read about in the book, was the decision um, to immediately shut down essentially 25% of the dealership network, uh, which in one stroke of the pen, uh, a decision that really almost no thought process went into, uh, it was sort of an arbitrary echo chamber um, of Wall Street guys talking to Wall Street guys and saying, hey, yeah, let's close down the ocean. We said, oh, we have bankruptcy, might as well do it. Uh, you know, put 100,000 jobs in jeopardy uh, in the midst of the greatest, uh, one of, you know, one of the greatest economic recession since the Great Depression. So I think there were definitely flaws in the process, but the fundamental idea of, of, of using any means necessary to prevent something that could have had, you know, really tremendous uh, impact uh, potentially. I mean, we don't know. I mean, there's others that say, well, it would have gone to bankruptcy, and other companies would have bought the pieces, and it would have made it more efficient, uh, and we wouldn't have had crushing unemployment and all those expenses. Um, but I, I think it's that one I, I, I give them a pass on. I think it probably was the right idea. Anyway, um, I want to preface my question.
question with a, a brief statement, and that is, <coughs> in case you want any of my students from my financial regulation course in the fall of 2008, uh, I think they would uh, attest to what I was saying, and that is we ought to let these banks fail. I have to say I didn't do that. I didn't take that position based on any special knowledge, any any empirical research on my point. It's just that I, I do believe in capitalism, and I thought, uh, you know, still think that our bankruptcy laws are robust enough to handle uh, the insolvency of large institutions, even large uh, financial institutions. But having said that, uh, you know, uh, what you described the statement switch is, is not consistent with what my understanding of what happened. And um, my understanding was that with all the the war that was going on in the fall of 08, uh, Paulson, Tiger, and others really didn't think that they were going to take the $700 billion and use it largely to buy up troubled assets. Capital holes were in the big banks, uh, in the banks, and, and actually came to a different conclusion based upon what they uh, they understood to be the reality, and that is that we needed to make these banks solvent before anything else could happen, and therefore they did have to change. Not they were going to. You know, beginning of the day's pitch, they actually had a change of mind themselves. So, you know, being there, and I didn't know that after the legislation was enacted, but you and you know, as the special inspector general of TARP, actually find uh, facts, evidence that would lead to what you just described, and that was deception on the part of those who designed. The legislation uh, with a preconceived intent and plan to uh, hold out one purpose, and that is to buy up troubled assets, but knowing at that time that they weren't going to do that? Well, there are two things. First of all, Colin said, um, the, the gentleman's answer to the question was that if they went into this, the hypothetical he was posing, if they went into this with the intent only to save the banks without ever having any intent about homeowners to see the broader policy goals that were put in the legislation, uh, that I described would have been a baby shift and, and, and been deceptive. Um, as to the, so, so, you know, that would only be baby shift if you described that that's what happened. Um, what did happen, uh, based on our investigations, and which included re- reading Hank Paulson's book, um, is that they were certainly considering going towards, and look, I don't fault them for shifting over from buying, um, uh, from buying troubled assets to, to equity and capital investments, which is probably the right thing to do. I, I don't think that they, they had a really well-developed plan or a time frame that would have enabled them to use purchases of, of troubled assets on a grand scale that would have had much of an impact. Um, and I think, you know, there are a number of factors that led to uh, the piece of Tiffany. What you're also doing, I think, was, was, was a major part of, of the decision-making. Uh, when it looked like Europe there was going to be some equity and capital investing, um, that, that, that helped force the issue. Uh, I think Paulson was certainly considering and you know putting into place plans to do equity capital investing before and while the bill was being signed. Um, I think there were also uh, senior members of Congress who were totally cognizant of that, who were encouraging that, both on Democrats and Republicans, um, who were looking at equity capital investing from the very beginning. Now, I think they looked at it from a slightly different perspective as Paulson, uh, Paulson was doing it again to control capital holes. Uh, I think they, uh, this is this, this part, is just my opinion. I think they saw that the Democrats could pass those nationalizations. Um, I don't know if they, I don't think they ever had the discussion of whether it would be common shares or, or preferred. Um, but you know, I, I actually, you know, and, and Lisa stood on this, I, I do think that that was a, an intentional baby shift of the troubled assets to, to equity capital. Uh, but for another reason, and that was explicitly contemplated within the bill. Um, the bill gave Treasury the right to either purchase troubled assets or to do equity capital. And the policy, this is the most important thing, the policy goals that were set forth by Congress and were promised by Treasury. Again, it was not just what Congress said and the Treasury was doing, it's what Treasury said they were doing 
was he totally coexisted with the idea of charging capital on the bank. Um, you can make provisions, requirements in the contract that address those policy goals. Now, now you may think those policy goals are, are, are and I think you should know, um, are nonsense and stupid and counterproductive and want to hurt because we want to force um, banks to, to lend more when we should have it with great period to be leveraging. Uh, and those may or may not be very accurate and, and, and strong arguments, but that's not what they said. And that's not what they did to get the vote. Uh, and that's not what Congress required, and that's not what they promised. Um, and so that's what I'm saying, is that if they went in this with the intent never to fulfill those goals, that's the basic switch, um, and that's defective, uh, and they got the right to bail out um, based on that deception. But, but no, I mean, the, the switch of, I don't even understand, I truly to this day don't understand how the, the, you know, the massive total asset purchase actually would have worked and how it could have been effective uh, given the, the, the severity of the crisis. Choice, and ultimately, I think it was a political choice 
not to help more homeowners or put in a more robust or effective program. Um, so that's part. And the second part of getting these necessary to protect the bank, um, if there certainly is, if there are degrees of panic and uh, there are certain things they could have done. And, and you know, Elizabeth Warren and, and the Oversight Panel has been was more outgoing and more critical of the terms of the bailout, which were a subsidy on very advantageous uh, uh, terms. I, I didn't really get into that debate in part, in part because I'm like, look, it's bailout. Uh, the definition of bailout is you're going to do it on advantageous terms and, and you're trying to do a subsidy. Um, but that part didn't bother me so much. I do think that they fell over themselves a little bit in areas uh, where they didn't necessarily need to pay 100 cents on the dollar. I don't think that the a, a haircut to AIG's counterparty, uh, which, by the way, again, it's not just me saying, hey, maybe it's a good idea that, that AIG's counterparty on the credit call clock should take a haircut. That was Tim Geithner's idea. Uh, he's the one who initiated, um, quote, unquote, negotiations. So obviously, he couldn't have believed that it was the worst thing that could have ever happened to the economy uh, because these were negotiations that were done under his authorization as president of the U.S. Fed. Um, but I think the, 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 the half-heartedness of those negotiations and the, um, the paying out of bonuses in March of 2009 uh, to the, the, the financial products executives, the unit that, of course, drove AIG into its $180 billion bailout and paying those out $100 on the dollar, I think those were decisions that were reflected far, far more from a ingrained ideological deference uh, to these institutions. You had people making that decision who had earned and enjoyed bonuses at a similar scale when they were on the other side of the bottom door. You had others who were just couldn't wait to spin through that door and get back and be on the receiving end of those bonuses. Um, and I think this, this concept of these preternaturally gifted supermen on Wall Street who are worth the 20 people who got $2 million of taxpayer money each uh, at AIGFP is just Leaves them to keep their jobs. Um, I think that was much more a result of ideological capture um, and, and ideology uh, than it was if we don't pay these guys these bonuses, uh, the economy is going to collapse. So, so I don't necessarily agree with that characterization. Zero and a true public servant, and uh, thank God for Neil Barofsky. <laughs>